Being joined again by pharmacist Tony Anderson from our Uyo studios. Hello and good morning, pharmacist Tony. Hello yes. and good morning. Well, it appears uh, there seems to be a little bit of an audio glitch there. But if you can hear me, uh, the MPOX case in the country has uh, been quite a very, very troubling one, especially for people who have been exposed to uh, the virus, particularly babies who have been placed in intensive care units. How much of a threat does this pose for the health of uh, Nigerians nationwide? Uh, it's a major concern because when you look at the recent statistics, uh, week five, according to the Nigeria Center for Disease and Control, if you look at the population from January 1st, uh, 224 to 1st September 224, a total of 19 children from the ages of 0 to 10 uh, uh, have confirmed cases of the MPOS. And uh, it appears the children are more vulnerable because of their lower immunity and uh, the fact that they could play more. They could have more playtime with persons that are maybe infected. And so, so far, uh, the population of those children of 0 to 10 are quite alarming and is also quite worrisome too. Uh, don't forget the strain we are having now are offspring of the previous trend, the GLAD-1 and GLAD-2 that was, you know, initially ravaged. With this new strain, it takes a lot of technology pharmaceutically to start producing newer vaccine that could be active on this particular GLAD-1B that is a, a affecting us now. And so the implication is that we may not have enough virus that will go around the entire countries of the world that are actually affected. And by implication, those vaccines will be rationed you know, to different countries and in lower quantities. And take, for instance, in the case of Nigeria, even when Nigeria receives it, the, the vaccines that come may not be adequate enough to go around because of the rationing proportion of it. And even when it comes in, NAPDAG may also need to do some due diligence to establish its safety profile and then is, uh, to make sure that it is safe before it's uh, administered to citizens. And so that's where we are now. Now, now Pharmacist Tony, most people would most likely want to know oh, what does the mpox virus look like i i believe a lot of people have heard about it uh, but they don't really know what the symptoms are and what to look out for to better protect themselves against the virus it's shortened for the monkey pause because uh monkey according to who Animals and countries shouldn't be stigmatized. And the MPOS virus is not entirely new to us, has been there, was first discovered 66 years ago in experimental monkeys in Denmark, uh, precisely in 1958. It is a zoonotic viral illness, and the virus is specifically from the family, a family of autopause virus. And uh, before now, we've been having two major strains, strain, strain one, which is normally found around uh, East Africa and uh, particularly in Congo. And we used to have the GLAD-2, which was found around West Africa and particularly in Nigeria. But recently, with uh, recent um, infections, we, have, we now have newer strains of the virus like we now have glad 1b which is what is affecting us mostly in this part then when you talk about uh, the symptoms the symptoms are simple you could have when somebody have an acute uh, illness with fever fever that is above 38.3 degrees celsius when they, they could be intense headache 
They could be muzzle, egg, and pains. They could be weakness and low energy. They could even be swollen limb nodes, uh, back pain, sore throat, and most especially rashes. Uh, the way the rashes goes is uh, very unique. Some people, the rash could be the first symptom. Some people, the first symptom could be fever, muscle ache, and sore throat. But for the rashes, what is most important for the rashes is that it starts from the face, spreads all over the body, to the sometimes sole of the feet, to the palms of the hands, uh, even to the genitals. Um, it spreads that way, and the rashes looks unique. It starts with a flat sore that later develops into blisters that have fluid in it. Then after that, the, it, it, it heals and forms crust. And so when you notice or you have either all or some of those symptoms, particularly the rashes, then it could be an indication that you've been infected and then uh, you'll be a suspected case and will be so, uh, your sample, the sample of the person will be subjected into the, into the laboratory uh, using the PCR technique to actually confirm that the person is actually uh, infected with the m virus. Well, pharmacist Tony Anderson, thank you for giving us a background for persons who might not know the symptoms to look out for in m -pox. But let's now also talk about contact tracing and vaccine support. We're told sometime last week that uh, the NCCC in Nigeria has traced 40 cases in 19 states and we were to expect 10,000 vaccines from the U.S. Do you have any knowledge on if Nigeria has taken uh, the uh, receipts of those vaccines and how are they going about administering? Is it sharing by states? And in terms of contact tracing, how much of a surveillance is on ground to forestall a wider spread of MPOX. NCDC is doing a very nice job. The, the contact tracing is going on well. And uh, for the vaccine, it's still being expected. I'm not fully aware if they have received it. But even when they receive it, the, the NAVDA will still need to do some due diligence before it's being given out. And then when you look at uh, the statistics of the MPOX, uh, virus, uh, if you check on the NCDC website, week 35, uh, if we look at, if we take from 1st September 2017, when, when, it, when that really, uh, you know, affected Nigeria, to 1st September 2024, uh, we find out that a total of 4,725 suspected cases have been established, and then as at 224 alone uh, from 1st January to 1st September, 935 cases, suspected cases, had been traced. Out of that, confirmed cases between uh, 1st September 2017 to 1st September 2024, 1,141 confirmed cases. Then just for January, 1st January to 1st September, 55 cases has actually been confirmed according to the data of the NCDC. Then when you look at deaths, uh, for 224, zero deaths, no death has been recorded so far. Uh, if you look at 223, there were two deaths, 222, 7, 221 and 221, uh, 221 and 220, there were zero deaths, 219 and 218, one death, and then 217 when it started, we had six deaths. So the total of death between 1st uh, September 2017 to 1st uh, September 2024 is actually 17 deaths. And then, as I said earlier, for 224, there is no death recorded so far to the glory of God. And then when you look at the states that are affected currently, according to the NCDC, we have 21 states plus the federal capital territory having uh, incidents. And then the local government around this entire state are actually 39. For all of this data to be chunked out, what it simply tells is that, or uh, what it implies is that the NCDC is top notch on their uh, contact tracing and have been able to trace appreciably for us to have this uh, contact uh, or this data coming in from their monitoring room.
Well, well, many people would uh, be wondering that at this point, uh, where these national health emergencies taking place in the country, uh, unlike the uh, Ebola outbreak, which was met with greed and brute force uh, by the health sector and it was tackled, the coronavirus came and it was also surmounted, many people will probably be wondering why we haven't had MPOX cases delivered to the country yet uh, by this time. That last point, clearly. Well, well, I was just wondering, why, why, have, why have we not had MPOX vaccines, I beg your pardon, M MPOX vaccines delivered to the country to ensure that this is fought head-on and the scourge or the virus is completely eradicated from the country? The, the vaccine, uh, being a new strain, well, we are having a new strain now, GLAD-1B, the processes of manufacturing and developing vaccines are quite an enormous one and then so many other countries outside Africa has also been affected and so what is happening there is shortage of this vaccine they may not have enough quantity to send to all country in the proportion they may desire and need and so what the manufacturer will do will be to send it in early quotes uh, uh, pro um, apportion it is spread so that it can get to all the countries that need it. And this is why in Nigeria, I'm always advocating that we should start looking inward to see how to produce most of this um, medication and even vaccine locally, so that when we have challenges like this, we do not need to depend on, the, on foreign partners and foreign countries for our vaccine supply. If we have for instance, a manufacturing firm in Nigeria that is, that is engaged in producing vaccine now, what the manufacturing plan to do will be to prioritize Nigeria first. And so they'll chunk out the vaccine and it will be here. Even though MPOS is a very serious case, we are lucky no death have been uh, recorded so far, but we must be deliberate and intentional about measures in ensuring that we don't have any kind of casualty occurring here. So the vaccine it, it may be there, but we are depending on uh, foreign supply. Uh, there could be logistics, there could be protocol and all of that. But in the future, to medicate on this, we should look at, the federal government should look at, look inwardly. We have so many uh, opportunities here, ranging from a, a, a bar preparation traditional medicine. There are so many things lying latent. Even the IPs, the active ingredient. We should have a way of having self-sufficiency pharmaceutically. It will, it will help us in so many diverse ways. It will help the government in generating revenue. It will also help us in being able to guide ourselves and protect ourselves. Because when you look at this uh, virus and these illnesses, more are still there to come. Most of those viruses are lying lanted and you don't know what will happen next and which one will happen again. And so we have, we have to up our game and look at what to do in the pharmaceutical industry so as to abate these kind of ugly situations. Now, Pharmacist Anderson, let's look at another worrying statistics in terms of our level of preparedness to combat diseases that come into our country. We could take it back down to Ebola, we could look at the influenza. We could also look at the most recent one that exposed our healthcare system in the COVID-19 pandemic, where even as little as PPEs, we depended from them to come into the country. Now, I would ask two questions. You've talked about in-house solutions towards locally manufactured drugs on the one hand, and even PPEs responding to these disease outbreaks. But even in terms of our border patrol, are you satisfied with the level of strictness in checking persons who might have manifested this symptom before coming into the country or may have been asymptomatic? They are trying their best. Uh, they are trying their best. Sometimes you look at manpower. There are a lot of factors that may you look at facility. You look at the technology there. Are they adequate men to mount it? What facility, what technology do they have? 
Apart from the borders, what we have to do is to increase preparedness and readiness in all, uh, uh, in all sectors, particularly like in pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical sectors, as I've, as I've earlier described. We need to look at how to manufacture. We need to look at how to put these things locally. That will be one sure way so that it will heighten our preparedness so that whatever that comes in within a very short while, we should be able to have medical solution, including vaccine, for it to combat it. Well, well do you think that perhaps the establishment of medical that, uh, research institutes in the country uh, and, and the proper look into our health sector will sort of help in curbing some of these issues and help our health sector to be better prepared for such medical emergencies or epidemics in this case? Institutes, there are a couple of them within the country, but it's, it, it goes beyond having research institutes. How much are they funded? What facility do they have? Well, what about capacity building? That is the aspect the government should be looking at because we have those research uh, institutions there. We have even the research institution in the university. We have so many people that have ideas on what to do, but most time research of this uh, magnitude are always very expensive. They're always capital intensive, and most research uh, center, most individuals that may even have uh, that knowledge may not even have the finance to um, carry out those research independently, and so there should be a serious consideration in terms of subsidy, in terms of grants, in terms of encouraging and making, uh, a, you know, an enabling atmosphere and environment for most of these research, research institutions and individuals. All of that are here in the country, but what we need to do is to up the game around them by funding and financing them appropriately. Now, still talking about the management now, and approach to disease outbreaks with MPOX in question, it has also been a challenge away from MPOX vaccine for even vaccines administered after birth in public health institutions in the country, many parents who have birthed children in the last few months complained that even government hospitals were lacking in some vaccines that needed to have been administered. Is there a way the federal government can indeed indicate more determination to combating this gap with vaccines, especially for the most susceptible or vulnerable group, which are children, in the light of diseases we are hoping to eradicate or eliminate? And have to be not just the federal government, the state government, and even the local government. All hands have to be on deck from the three tiers of the government to make sure that, for instance, primary health centers uh, that are domiciled in local government, with the autonomy that local government uh, chairmen are going to be having now, I would advise they should prioritize. They should prioritize health and make sure that whatever that comes from the federal government or from the state government, the three tiers of government should have a way of upgrading it. They should have a way of giving it support because at the end of the day, all we do centers on the patient. Like you've just rightly mentioned that basic vaccines are not there. The point is whose fault is it? Is money not being appropriated for it? Who's responsible for it? Who's supposed to provide for it? Was it not captured in the budget? So we have to look at the chains of supply and see what is really happening there. And then the government has to be very deliberate and intentional in providing all of those basic va vaccines needed. If not, you have children coming up and developing so many avoidable ailments and diseases that should ordinarily be uh, you know, avoided by the use of vaccines. Now, now, Honorable Tony Anderson, I don't know if you had preview to a comment that was made by the Coordinating Minister of Social Welfare and Health, Professor Ali Pate, who categorically told the media that 260 billion naira was available for the revitalization of primary health care. Uh, many are thinking that in light of these gaps, which we have discussed largely, this money needs to be reappropriated to checkmate some of these critical concerns in terms of vaccines particularly 
such amount has been appropriated, then we shouldn't have uh, scarcity kind of of those vaccines. And other than that too, I still would emphasize that having this thing manufactured and produced locally would even help us reduce such huge amount and would even uh, contribute to the uh, internally generated revenue. Now, 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 let's also look at some of the gaps in terms of our approach to healthcare in general in Nigeria. One of which is also the brain drain. Most of your colleagues, both in the pharmaceutical angle and in clinical medicine, are looking to migrate away from the country and they have cited issues of welfare. We've seen repeated strikes by bodies where associations, either or medical associations or pharmaceutical practitioners, have also taken strike actions to voice out their disgruntlement. But most surprisingly is uh, the level of approach on the part of the government in dialoguing, even where grievances can be settled in better remuneration. Uh, what do you say in regards to engendering a more patriotic healthcare system through improved welfare? Uh, the take home, the salary has to be what will be able to take, you know, those uh, the medical professionals home adequately. When you look at uh, social inequality, uh, when you look at the turbulence in the economy, the hike in everything, energy, and all of that, you find out that uh, why most of these professional medical doctors, nurses. Pharmacies and every other professional uh, living the country is because there's better future where they are going to. The cost of living there are lower. The technologies are there. They have more peace of mind. What about even insecurity? Recently, you are aware that uh, you know there have been pockets of kidnaps of um, medical doctors, pharmacies here and there. And so you find out that the environment they are working with is becoming more toxic. Why people are leaving the country to other country is simply because they have better opportunity where they are going to. I'm dreaming to see a Nigeria where people will come from other countries, West Africa, Africa, and other places to want to practice in the nearest future. And this can only occur if the government is very deliberate and intentional about what they do about welfare. When you look at the cost of petrol today, from 850 to 1300 what does that tell you it gives you more hopeless situation ahead of time and so more people will be willing to leave because they are, they may not have that coping mechanism to still remain in the country why they have better opportunity outside and you what? see the government coming in with so many ideology about stopping that drift in manpower most of those things, in my own opinion, may really not work. What will work is fixing the economy, fixing security, fixing power. Most of these hospital pharmaceutical, they need energy to drive. When you look at the history of most big pharmaceutical companies exiting, when you trace the history, it's just one or two, three factors. One of them now is cost of energy. Somebody is running maybe a hospital, a pharmaceutical industry, how much energy is the person spending vis-a-vis -vis the profit they are making? When you also look at the uh, cost of uh, forest, also, that, uh, you, you remember the Glasmo Smith that had been in the country yes, over 51 years? They just left the country because of some of those factors. And as soon as they left, you saw ice spike in their, uh, pro, uh, the their product, their Ventolin inhaler. Most of those are basic uh, support uh, uh, products went 10 times uh, the price. But that would not have been there because it's not only the individuals or the professionals that are drifting off or leaving the country. But Even what, the what, what companies are also either leaving or breaking down. Ph pharmacists we have a, 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 a strange manufacturing company in Aquibon here that was doing very well. Today, there are no more there. If you take a visit to that manufacturing company is grown with grasses. Grasses are even getting taller than the building, a place that was doing well. So you find out that there seems to be almost a total collapse and this hopelessness and then uh, having very 
uh, uh, bleak future, no hope ahead, is what is causing this dream. So it's a natural process and can only be uh, handled naturally by making sure that the atmosphere and the environment is right. Well, well, Pharmacist Tony, it's quite an unfortunate uh, situation, uh, the, the massive drift off in our health sector and the mass migration of health uh, professionals from Nigeria to other clients of the world where they have better wages and better living conditions uh, as well. However, year after year, Nigerian universities churn out graduates, doctors, nurses, pharmacies, and the likes. Uh, the, the labor market is getting oversaturated by the day, and it appears like government health institutions do no longer have space to accommodate uh, uh, these uh, fresh graduates. What's the place of private health uh, sector uh, stakeholders in ensuring that adequate jobs are provided for health uh, professionals in order to keep them in the country and deter them from leaving to offer their services to other nations? What that simply means is that uh, budget for health has to be prioritized. There must be more expansion you know, towards uh, uh, government hospitals, general hospitals. Most of those hospitals are even short staff. It's like a paradox situation. You have health uh, professionals seeking for jobs, and then they are not being employed, and then you have facilities that are not having adequate manpower across all the uh, medical profession. And then the reason could be government may not be able to absorb all of them. That is why the private sector is very key. But on the private sector, they're having a lot of challenges now. Most of them are even collapsing. Most of them are unable to, uh, you know, even to set up. Most of them are not doing, it's, it's neither here nor there. But what the government need to do is to have maybe uh, for instance, in the uh, pharmaceutical sector, is to set up a, a special kind of loan or bank that could be called a pharma bank kind of thing, where loans are given at almost no interest. And then they should have a way of subsidizing for most of these big pharmaceutical, even hospital. If the environment is right, we are going to have more private expansion and from there, we are going to have more professional outside the street being absorbed. And more people will be able to set up theirs with ease. And that will be, uh, that will be a, a way out in trying to reduce the trips in manpower outside the country. Now, let's resume focus on the pharmaceutical sector, which you are much a key player in. You cited the exit of GSK and also the state of the more bond largest syringe manufacturing company in Nigeria situated in a Kwaibum state. In light of this seemingly harsh business environment that has forced the exit and closure of such a manufacturing uh, plant that injects one of the basic care items into pharmaceutical care, uh, what can the government do to make the ease of doing business even more suitable for pharmaceutical stakeholders and also attract international giants in the pharmaceutical sector back into the country? The, the, the government have to have a review on their policy, and that is, uh, that is very key. The cost of energy is very high. That is a big factor that will make even much more companies to fail. And then the forest availability and accessibility. I'm of the opinion that this forest should be made available to this key sector so that if they have availability of funding, they will be able to be uh, in business. In fact, I don't know how the government will do it, but I would say that uh, the pharmaceutical and health sector should be completely subsidized. Those private uh, practitioners should have a way out, just like they went in bailout airlines when airlines were dwindling after the COVID-19. There are times government come to bail out a, a lot of this sector. I think it's high time that the pharmaceutical sector should be bailed out so that much could be done. Research will go on well. We want to see this research. When we do this research there, here, we'll be able to uh, solve these problems locally. We shouldn't, there's over-reliance 
on um, imported and then foreign expatriate. Take, for instance, the vaccine for the emperors. The vaccines, we don't know how many we are getting. They say 10,000. They could give you 10,000 or decide to even give you lower. But if we are doing those things locally here, we won't be thinking of, you know, or waiting for vaccine to come. We'll have vaccine enough that could go around the entire citizen. And so what the government needs to do is to provide the enabling environment. When the enabling environments are right, we have energy right, we have forest uh, right, then it's going to boost production. Most of those people that are even drifting out will, see, will now find reason to return. More foreign companies will have reason to come and invest in the country. It's because of the way the country is now economically that as, as much as more companies are even collapsing, exiting, or stopping production, that are not good indications to even encourage foreign uh, companies to come invest or to in, in, encourage other investors to come into the Nigeria. And even the issue of insecurity. Insecurity should be taken paramount in this country. If we can solve energy problem, if we can solve problem of insecurity, if the government could be very intentional and sincere in what they are doing, then Nigeria will even be a better place to be. Now, pharmacist Tony, as much as I agree with you that the government needs to address some policies, there's also the concern of the influence of Western imperialism. And I'll take you back to the case study during COVID-19, when the small island of Madagascar came out and told the world that they had developed a vaccine for COVID. The resistance they faced in getting approvals from WHO uh, to give the vaccine the accredited value and allow for it to be disbursed to citizens and other African countries that were interested in importing was a huge concern. Uh, do you believe that if Nigeria steps into the shoes of the likes of Madagascar in line with finding a vaccine for MPOX, that they won't face some of those hurdles as experienced by Madagascar in regards to accreditation of their vaccines? Point is to start. Let us start something in that regard. And if I can still recall the case of that Madagascar, uh, it wasn't really vaccine that they developed. They had some herbal regimen that they claim was, you know, uh, effective in treating the COVID-19. Uh, I don't think, if, I'm, uh, if I can recall well, that it was actually vaccine. They were, you know, uh, herbal regimen that was indigenous to them. But even at that, I think at some point, even that the bar regimen fell because COVID-19 also had a toll in Madagascar. If any country or any nation or any company has a vaccine that has gone through clinical trials and has been certified as being safe with high efficacy, then such vaccine would definitely fly. There may be some obstacles. There may be some little, little politics. Like you've mentioned, Madagascar. Madaka they were able to do something probably because they have a lot of support from their, uh, from their leaders there uh, and they were able to do something. I also want to see Nigeria do something first. Let it be hurdles. When we get the bridge, we'll cross. Let's start from somewhere. Well, well Pharmacist Tony, talking about local, <laughs> herbs, local herbs and uh, medication, it appears that most people are gradually turning their attention towards that form of medicine as an alternative to the pharmaceutical uh, medicines, medicines that are perhaps too expensive for them to afford now in the country. Firstly, how safe are these herbal medications considering the fact that most of them are not given with a particular dosage? Uh, people just buy these, uh, these herbs and they are just asked to drink them for over a period of time without a specific uh, a guideline as to the dosage they are supposed to take. Let me get your reaction on this. Issues with the herbal preparations. But my worry and concern, you know, in the pharmaceutical world, there's a popular saying in the pharmaceutical world that our, the medication we take will kill us, will kill patients more even than the disease. What that simply means is that whatever we are taking as medicine must be standardized. We must have adequate 
clinical information about it. We must know the dosing. We must know how the, uh, the medication will react on the system. Most of this is about preparation, not all of them. I'm, I'm also impressed. Some persons are having their herbal uh, uh, preparation being standardized in the country now. And there's also people coming in as a group or association to make it better. But a, a larger part of this herbal preparation are actually not standardized. And so you cannot tell their safety. When you look at the high rise of liver, kidney, and uh, uh, liver failure and kidney failure, and most of this, uh, if you look at the statistics in the country, it becomes worrisome. In my own opinion, I always feel that most of this medication, particularly the herbal, that does not have standardization, may also be contributing somehow to some of this organ failure we are having. And uh, again, when you look at the herbal and traditional preparation, when you take, for instance, China, China have upped their game that most of their herbal uh, preparations are well standardized and is giving them revenue, churning out revenue in millions, of uh, um, in millions of their currency there. If you look at Nigeria, we have so many latent um, uh, uh, Latin uh, herbal preparation lying up there. There are no information about them. And then you also look at some of the constraints. Most of the people that have this table preparation, because it was handed over to them by their uh, father, great-grandfather, and all of that, most times there is that non-disclosure of what they use and what they prepare. Most times they are not willing to divulge information about it because they feel it's an inheritance. They feel divulging the information. But if the government comes in, regulates them, give them some patent rights, encourage them, seminar, symposium, looking at that herbal preparation, we could have so much uh, revenue being generated uh, you know, through it if the government pays priority and attention on it. But so far, yeah. because most of them are not standardized, most of them are missed in different liquid without any standard formula for it. Most of them could be risky, and I don't subscribe to those ones that have not been standardized. Well, well in terms of, of people who you know, parade themselves, especially on social media, as uh, licensed herbalists or with all different kinds of names, and they sell these herbal mixtures that you spoke about, how can they be regulated just the way medical practitioners are regulated in the country? In closing now, we have just a few minutes. On social media, may have so many white white claims. I agree with you. Some of them may have been certified by NAVDAC. I agree with you. Some of them may be standardized, but I know that majority of them are not standardized, and that is why you see one herbal preparation having claim of solving almost all the health challenges. They bring out one herbal product, uh, product, and they will list over maybe 20 or 30 airmen that that particular herbal preparation could you know, conquer. My question is, how did they get to do that? Are they clinical trials? How did they, could that, be, so, uh, could that be verified? And so most of them are just for the sake of selling, but some have been standardized. As I said earlier, those ones that are standardized are fewer. We have more that are more percentage that are not standardized than the ones that are standardized. And in doing this, there should be a, a national kind of uh, consideration task force because it's a national problem in every state, in every locality. You have one person doing one traditional thing. They should be, if they are well regulated, if they are well reg reg regulated, if their capacities are being built, if they are funding for research institution, uh, you know, even from the university, to get some of these samples and then do proper clinical trials on them, we may be surprised at what we can get, you know, from the herbal preparation. What I'll say that the herbal preparation have a lot of potential, but they are not really being announced uh, as at this moment.
Well, we must thank you, pharmacist Tony Anderson, for taking our time to dialogue with us on the show this morning. We do appreciate you and wish you the best of the weekend ahead.